Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, good morning to those of uh, you joining from New York uh, or the Americas. Good afternoon to all of our friends joining from the other side of the Atlantic and uh, a very good evening to those who have stayed up late in Asia for the event. Uh, my name is Madeline Sinclair. I am one of the co-directors of ISHR's New York office, and I also lead our work on reprisals related to engagement with international and regional human rights systems. Welcome to the launch of ISHR's new report, UN Action on Reprisals Towards Greater Impact, a quantitative analysis of the scope and impact of UN action on intimidation and reprisals through the lens of the Secretary General's We'll put a link to the full report in the chat for those who haven't had a chance to download it yet. Um, and before we start, I just wanted to outline a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, the event is in web format, so audience members can engage through questions and comments using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, but won't be given the floor separately to speak. Um, please do engage throughout, and we will take questions either as they come or towards the end of our discussion with panelists. If you ask a question, please share your affiliation if you're comfortable doing so uh, and indicate whether your question is directed at a specific panelist or at all. There is no interpretation uh, for the event. Unfortunately, I apologize for that. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be uploaded subsequently to our YouTube channel. Uh, we're also tweeting using the hashtag end reprisals. Please consider using it as well if you are tweeting and we can also share that in the chat. Uh, before I tell you a little bit more about the study and the report, as well as how the event will unfold, uh, please let me take a moment just to introduce our panel, uh, many of whom need no introduction. We're very pleased to have with us today Ambassador James Roscoe from the UK Mission to the UN, who is Ambassador to the General Assembly and on Human Rights. We're also very pleased and honored to have with us Ilse Brands Karras, the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights and UN Senior Official on Reprisals and Intimidation. We also have with us two human rights defenders, Mariam Alkawaja and Christina Palabe, as well as the author of the report, Yannicka Spanigel of the Global Public Policy Institute. I will introduce each of them more fully uh, before their interventions. In terms of how the event will unfold, we'll hear introductory remarks in a moment from Ambassador Roscoe, following which Yannicka will present the report, including the methodology, main findings, and key recommendations coming out of the study. Following her presentation, we'll hear some general remarks by the ASG before diving a bit deeper into some of the findings, recommendations, and questions surfaced through the research with our panelists through a Q&A style discussion. Uh, again, we welcome audience participation through comments and questions in the Q&A box, and we will make an effort to get to as many of those as possible. So let me now tell you a little bit about the study and our motivation for embarking on this work before passing the floor to Ambassador Roscoe. Um, as many of you are undoubtedly aware, ISHR has been working for a long time on the issue of reprisals related to engagement with the UN, both on individual cases on behalf of victims and also from the perspective of strengthening the institutional response. The issue of reprisals has formally been on the agenda of the UN for 30 years now, beginning with a resolution at the Commission on Human Rights in 1990 and a first annual report of the Secretary General in 1991. Many of you will also be aware of the concerted efforts to strengthen the work on this issue in the Human Rights Council beginning in, uh, early in the last decade, culminating in the very welcome appointment by the SG of the ASG as in 2016. You'll hear more about this in a minute, but one of the study's key findings is that the appointment and increase in resources that came along with it directly translated into better reporting and follow up on cases. However, at this juncture, almost five years since the appointment of the senior official and with reprisals still occurring in unacceptable numbers and severity, we wanted to take a step back and consider the available data on incidents and what could be gleaned from an analysis of that data. Broadly, we wanted to consider whether there are patterns or trends in the kinds of reprisals cases that are reported to the UNSG over the past decade. What were the outcomes of those cases and how did reprisals victims perceive the effectiveness of UN bodies raising their cases with governments? Of course, the biggest question of all is how should the answers to those questions and others shape 
the response by the UN and other stakeholders so that intimidation and reprisals can be prevented and addressed more effectively. With all that in mind, we worked with Yannicka from GPPI to design a study, which you'll hear much more about in a moment, to examine these questions. We're very grateful also to have benefited from close collaboration with OHCHR colleagues, as well in the design and parameters of the study and in the data analysis, which was enormously helpful. Uh, with that very brief introduction, I'd like to now give the floor to Ambassador Roscoe to make some opening remarks. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Madeline, and thank you um, to ISHR for, for hosting this today um, and obviously for the, for the brilliant report. And thank you to everyone who's come along um, for the conversation. It's great uh, to see you here. Um, the UK really cares about this issue and we care about it because essentially a good relationship, an effective relationship between civil society human rights defenders um, and the UN is, is essential to the UN um, working properly. Um, civil society, human rights defenders, they, they enrich um, our decision-making, they make us better informed, they give us a sense of what's really happening on the ground. Um, and so they ensure that our decisions, um, the decisions that we take at the UN um, uh, understand and hopefully matter um, at the local level. Um, they also ensure that when we set norms here in New York, there are people on the ground, committed people on the ground, who are able to work within their countries to help make sure those norms are implemented. So it's a critical symbiotic relationship um, between the two, um, between the UN and, and these groups. Obviously, a prize, a reprisals fundamentally undermine that relationship, and that's why we care about ending reprisals, because reprisals are a way of preventing civil society and NGOs from engaging effectively with the UN and so disrupting um, that symbiotic relationship that we want to that we want to find. Um, now, obviously, civil society over the last year or so have also faced um, new barriers um, to engaging with the UN, mainly because of COVID-19. And we've had I think for me, um, you know, the, the great tragedy of having, you know, uh, CSW without civil society um, and many other events um, where you need to have people in the room, in the building, in our faces, frankly, um, trying to influence us. So that's been one of the great challenges of the last year. Um, so, so what we try to do, what the UK tries to do is um, we try to make sure that there is language in UN texts that allow for broad civil society participation. And we often face challenges to that and we face barriers to that. Um, in fact, we've had to go to the floor of the GA um, in a modalities resolution recently to ensure that civil society participation can be as full as it is. And that was the HIV AIDS resolution where we had to amend um, a, a chair's text on the floor. But the key thing for me there is we succeeded. Um, and uh, there was a groundswell of states um, who wanted to join us in supporting the protection and the inclusion um, of civil society. Um, so I guess my main point here today is everyone on this call will probably agree um, that we need to engage civil society from the UN's perspective and we need to make sure that civil society are as engaged and involved as they can be. But one of the, the great impediments and one of the growing impediments to that is reprisals. And we have a, a case which we're currently working on um, in, um, in Africa where someone who came to support um, evidence by civil society to the Security Council um, was, was intimidated and we're trying to address that as we speak. So it's a live um, issue. It's really critical therefore that we've got these SGs um, reports um, to look at the annual report on the issue of reprisals. Um, but the report is lessons we can learn from this, which is why we're here today. Um, we, the UK, are really interested in what we can take away from these reports, what they tell us, and what they teach us about the reality on the ground, but critically, um, what states can do to challenge this behavior and try and ultimately stop this behavior. So thank you for today. We're really looking forward. 
Thank you so much, Ambassador, for that um, thoughtful introduction and also for the UK's continued uh, support and dedication to this issue. I'd like to now give the floor to Yannicka, who's going to present the study, its findings, recommendations that have come out of it. Yannicka, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to present this report, which I think um, unearthed some very interesting findings. And I also want to thank everyone who supported this study. Today, I won't be able to present all the findings uh, that are in the report, but I hope that you will be inspired to take a deeper dive um, after the event. Now, as Madeleine mentioned already, our objective with the study was twofold. On the one hand, we wanted to analyze patterns or trends in reprisal cases reported by the Secretary General, and um, also to investigate their outcomes and impact. So in a first step, we coded all Secretary General reports since 2010 into a data set that ended up having 709 entries, which include named cases of individuals and organizations, unnamed cases, general situations, and also preemptive statements. In a second step, we then conducted a survey among victims and their representatives for a random sample of named cases. But let's first focus on step one. With this new data set, we see for the first time the big picture of what kind of reprisal cases have been documented in SG reports and what UN actions have been taken on those cases. When analyzing this data, we need to always bear in mind that this is only the information that has been publicly reported by the Secretary, Secretary General. So it is not a comprehensive picture of all reprisal cases that occurred around the world because not all were reported to the UN. And it also does not include cases on which action was taken behind closed doors. These limitations are very important in the interpretation of the data, and I will come back to that in a few minutes. Let's first take a look at the number of cases and situations reported in each SG report. We see a major and very clear boost in reprisal work with the appointment of the senior official in 2016. Many more cases were reported in SG reports after that. This curve also helps to underscore this tip of the iceberg issue that I just mentioned. There have been in those previous years and likely still are today, many more cases out there in the world that are recorded by the UN. So we cannot draw definitive conclusions on reprisals in the world at large. Now, if you're familiar with the SG reports, you know that they also include a section that provides follow-up information on previous cases. Here we see a similarly impressive achievement in terms of the number of cases addressed in that section over the past three years, which reflects the fact that there is now also proactive research done on developments in previously raised cases. However, we saw in the previous chart that the number of new cases increased simultaneously. And in addition, the cases in the follow-up set section were tracked more consistently over time, which is a good thing. But for this reason, still only 28% of the named cases from 2019 saw a follow-up in the next report. So it is quite clear that with only two staff positions, the reprisals team is still struggling to keep up with the wealth of information on new cases, the task of following up on previous cases, and also to coordinate the action across the UN system. So I think these findings make a very good case for attributing more resources to the team for further improved and, and possibly also more frequent reporting, for more follow-up, um, for even better coordination and also more internal analysis on these cases. Now, if we look at the geographic distribution of the reported cases, in our reports annex, you will find an exhaustive list of all countries that have been addressed in the 11 SG reports. Here I'm showing the top 10 of that list. So the worst offender countries, both in terms of all reported reprisal issues over that time period, and also of named cases only. And in this list, it is worth pointing out that uh, out of these countries alone, um, four are current members of the Human Rights Council. And if we look at the current 47 members of the Human Rights Council, we find that 21 were cited with reprisal issues over the past five years. 
considering that members should, should uphold the highest human rights standards and fully cooperate with the Council, such figures are obviously very problematic. In terms of regional distribution of the cases, uh, looking at seven geographical world regions, we find that the MENA Middle East and North Africa region is by far the one with the most reported reprisal issues. And it represents even 35% um, if we only consider named cases. North America is missing in this chart because uh, those countries have not yet been addressed in SG reports. Now, these numbers tell us in which countries and regions reprisal and in intimidation problems are particularly pervasive. However, we need to bear in mind that there are likely data gaps in the SG's cases, and especially in those countries where human rights defenders cannot engage with the, with the UN to begin with, or where reprisals are not reported for fear of further retaliation. So to highlight this problem, we compared the SG data to a measure of civil society robustness, which you see here on the left side. This measure assesses the degree to which a country's civil society is free and autonomous from the state. This chart is actually not in the report, but we named in the report the countries that are here in the lower left corner. Those um, countries have a very low civil society robustness uh, score and none or very few reported cases in the SG reports. So these are likely blind spots that have not been given enough attention. So with that, uh, I have two more recommendations. First, there should be more robust political action taken against countries with systematic reprisal practices, which we now see in the data. And this also includes that prospective council members should be scrutinized for their reprisal records. And the second recommendation on this topic is that more attention needs to be paid to those countries with highly restricted civil society on which there are hardly any documented cases so far. And I think the regional disparities that we saw also weren't further study. Now, which types of original engagement with the UN had led to the reported reprisals? We found that most of those reported reprisals were linked to participation in a UN meeting outside one's country, followed by remote submissions of information and meetings with UN officials inside one's country. There were also some reprisals reported in connection with having one's case of human rights violation raised by the UN. The same analysis can be made uh, with regard to the UN entities that reprisal victims had interacted with. Engagement with the Human Rights Council is leading the list, followed by special procedures and treaty bodies. Now, it is very important for me uh, to highlight that these patterns do not necessarily show us which type of engagement is more risky in terms of drawing reprisals. Rather, these figures tell us where reprisals tend to be reported more often. For example, people who travel abroad, often to Geneva or New York, usually have a personal contact with the UN of offices or organizations like ISHR, which makes a reprisal much more likely to be reported than if people submit information remotely without any personal contact. The SG reports also give us information about other UN actors that have previously raised a given case, for example, the treaty bodies or the special procedures and so on. On the one hand, we found a positive picture of what looks like increased coordination on reprisals across the UN system, because there has been a clear diversification in the different UN entities that took action prior to the SG report. On the other hand, we also see an increasing number of cases that are only raised in the SG reports without previous public action by other actors. And with our data, we can also investigate how well different entities perform in addressing their own cases. Here, we found that only 6% of reprisal cases connected to the Human Rights Council was actually um, acted upon publicly by the Council Presidency. In comparison, special procedures reportedly took action on 80% of their cases and treaty bodies in 54% of cases connected to their work. And while this is much better than the council figure, there is, of course, room for improvement for all of these entities. 
So in sum, we see that reprisals happen at all points of contact with the UN. As Ambassador Roscoe pointed out earlier in the introduction, um, this poses a big problem to the functioning of the UN bodies and mechanisms which hugely rely on those external testimonies. But these entities also have a moral and one can argue a legal responsibility to address such cases of reprisals connected to their own work. So it should be clear that all UN entities dealing with human rights defenders and victims need to adopt clear protocols on how to prevent and respond to such cases. The Council Presidency and others clearly need to step up their game and the Assistant Secretary General could play a role in further encouraging and coordinating such efforts. So on the impact question, um, in the second step of our study, we took a random sample from the cases of named individuals or organizations for a survey on outcomes and impact. We received responses for 68 out of 100 cases, and the sample seems relatively representative of the SGs named cases over the 11 year period. We asked questions about respondents' familiarity with the case, um, their awareness of UN action, their impact assessment, and also the further case development. Out of the 68 survey respondents, 46, that's almost three quarters, were affected individuals themselves. In terms of their awareness of the UN actions, we found that over 40% were not fully aware of those actions on their behalf at the time they were taken. Some actually only learned about them through our survey. I think this is clearly problematic and echoes the need for those clear protocols and prevention and response to reprisals that I just mentioned. So what did we find on impact? Let's focus on the short term. Here, on 38% of the cases, respondents indicated that they thought the UN action had a positive impact. For 40%, it reportedly made no difference, and the 9% respondents indicated a negative impact. If we compare this information to case, development, case developments, only 24 improved in the short term, 46% stayed the same, and 25% even deteriorated. So we can see a clear discrepancy between the positive impact assessment in 38% and case improvements in 24%. Why is that? Um, from the qualitative responses that we also asked from uh, in the survey, two explanations emerge. One is that even though there was a noteworthy impact by UN action on the situation, it did not change the situation as a whole. And the other explanation is that the impact consisted in a psychological effect on the individual of having their case raised and being legitimized by the UN, which can be immensely important even though the repressive situation itself might not have changed. And now I come to the last and perhaps most interesting finding of the study. We looked at how the impact assessment in the long term differed for cases that were raised once, twice, or more times by different UN bodies, including follow-up mentions in the SG reports. This chart here suggests a clear correlation between those two elements. We see that a positive long-term impact tends to be reported more frequently for reprisal cases that were raised more often by the UN. Actually, the share of positive impact assessments even roughly grows with um, the number of mentions, except for some high profile cases that were raised eight or more times. We also see that negative long term long term impact um, by UN actions uh, where it was reported this related mostly to cases that were addressed once or twice by the UN. So this leads me to my last recommendation, namely that the UN needs to provide sustained attention and follow up throughout the UN system. UN actors need to break with the practice of disengaging on a case once another actor gets involved. And reprisal cases should not just be forwarded to the ASG and the reprisals team. Instead, actors need to assume their own responsibility to take action and ideally also ask others to intervene as well, in addition to subsequent um, documentation in SG reports. So here, a brief summary of the recommendations. I think overall we can say 
that the UN's efforts around reprisals have increased remarkably over the past few years since the appointment of the senior official. But there is still ample room for improvement. And thanks to the analysis of the reprisals data, I think we have a better understanding of what could and should be done better. So by doing so, I hope that the study also brought home the point that the systematic analysis of such data, whether done externally or internally by the UN itself, can be extremely useful to identify what works and what doesn't, and also to guide future courses of action. And with that, um, I want to thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Yannicka, for that very comprehensive um, and clear overview. Um, I know there is a lot more to discuss, and we will get to it in the Q&A uh, segment of the event. I just want to give the floor briefly to the ASG so that she may provide uh, some general remarks at the outset before we dive into that discussion. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madeleine. And um, I wanted also to thank IASHR and Global Public Policy Institute for having me here also to engage, to listen to you and to engage in the discussion, but for the, for the study itself. It really is a very important contribution to the thinking we have around it. And I would say, and, and certainly it will be very helpful to us um, in, in our work going ahead. But also, I think it's a very good timing, as you noted in the times from 2016 until now five years, it's a very good point to do some stock taking and see, and in particular, learning the lessons so that they guide us in how we go ahead and how we keep improving this work, which of course has, has been uh, intensely developed in these five years, but still has a long way to go. Certainly, I fully agree with that. So thank you to begin with. Um, we do... Uh, it, understand, and I'm, I'm glad Ambassador, Ambassador Roscoe, of course, mentioned the, the key point, which is that we simply cannot do our work if we don't have uh, civil society uh, partners and, and uh, to interact with. The whole legitimacy, the effectiveness of our work depends on that. So that's why we simply won't be able to fulfill our mandate if we are, if people are afraid of engaging with the UN uh, or our representatives, whether it's in the field or, or at headquarters or are punished for doing so. So that's, I fully agree with that statement of the key focus we need to continue to have on the issue of reprisals. We also have, I'm very glad to see that in the panel, the discussions we will have, we have two prominent uh, women who will give us their testimonies and, and thoughts. But the, the role of women human rights defenders, as we know, uh, we need to pay particular attention to. We also have had studies, uh, the issue of COVID has affected all of us in different ways, but we certainly see also that even during this phase, it's been an even more vulnerable and worse situation for women human rights defenders uh, during this time. But in general, that I think in the study, the point was also made on the gender uh, differences in the types of cases and so on. I think that's something that we also have tried to um, see how we can further develop our understanding and focus and analysis on this case. So just to mark that as well. So for the data used in the study, we do have um, a very glad to see that the quantitative analysis, um, it has its limitations, of course, in the data set that is there, just as you pointed out, since this is actually based on the, uh, on the SD's reports and therefore those cases that go in there uh, into the report itself. But I'm glad to, to see the acknowledgement that there are improvements in both tracking and reporting on tra uh, reprisals, a very key point. Um, and of course, happy that I'm following on ASG Gilmore in, in this very important work and that was given this role as well. And I'm glad to see that that actually has led to an increased focus and also improvements in that regard. So we are tracking, of course, as you point out, what is generally hidden. It's something that is not out there. The data isn't there to be go out and have it. So this, of course, and often it also doesn't leave any traces. So how do we get to that information? How do we encourage to bring the information to us? So I fully agree also that we always need to remember the tip of the iceberg that was mentioned, that this is only a very small amount of cases that unfortunately are indicative of a much, much bigger and deeper problem. Now, that's not 
restricted only to reprisals. We know this, and unfortunately, is that the underreporting is, of course, a, a common issue when it comes to all kinds of uh, uh, cases with uh, not being reported on discrimination, on hate crime, and all other uh, ways of oppressing groups of people or active active members of society. But still, we need to to be aware and and see what we can do about that. So we, we, of course, know that we don't get the information um, on everything uh, that goes on in terms of reprisals for cooperation with us. And we also know that there is a lot of different reasons for this. It, it, it can be also awareness. And the parallel I drew to those cases that are not reported for, for complaints, uh, um, maybe uh, institutions and mechanisms that we see in other cases, maybe here as well, that maybe people are not aware of, so we need that information to get out there uh, more of how to actually make sure that those cases are brought to our attention. Various ways of, uh, you know, there are other reasons to make those choices of reporting or not. It's also an issue of capacity and of course, fundamentally fears and trust. We need to bring in also the element of trust very clearly. The trust in the UN overall um, and, and, and particularly in the mandate and how we can increase uh, that, that trust is obviously an ongoing challenge as well. But for the findings and recommendations, um, we, I'm glad to see, I fully agree that we need to do more. And this is why it's so useful to have a study that indicates maybe more clearly where exactly we need to focus uh, on. We have this in terms of the communication channels, uh, also in terms of the documentation, but one issue that I've been discussing very much with, with my small team, as you pointed out, only two team members, excellent and brilliant, but nevertheless only two, two members, so we're limited, but we are looking at discussing on how can we get disaggregated data so that we can more closely follow what happens to certain, you know, which groups are more vulnerable and how do we know this? Um, and and that, that is a challenge in itself in data collection, which we can come back to in the discussion. But so we, we certainly know that we need to focus on that, as well as strengthening a victim-centered approach that you also point out in the study. Um, the internal coordination, of course, is a continuing um, challenge that we are working on, but we certainly need to continue to do that. And very uh, glad that you pointed out, you know, the follow up and following on the impact and how do we address impact? How do we get towards more positive outcomes? Um, and that is a whole big set of, of questions as well. So the patterns that the study um, does, does um, highlight, we know, uh, we know already on the geographical scope that you pointed out the distribution of cases in terms of the main triggers, um, also the UN bodies, the mechanisms uh, that have most incidents on record, and also the issues that you bring up on the government responses. But it's good to have that, the confirmation of having this kind of systematic uh, study on it. So for, for my role, the ASG's role and the practice, I think that uh, we do, um, we do, of course, work, as you point out, on the principle, and it's a fundamental principle for us, that the response should be taken where the first, uh, for the first respondent. So where the interaction takes place is also is that body or that entity uh, that, or that unit that should be taking the action, including also preventive action. Um, and that, of course, is a responsibility. You point this out too. And I just wanted to say, and I'm very glad you mentioned that all of those entities that deal with human rights should explicitly, you know, we, we uh, have clear guidance and protocols for this. I would just say that I think it actually goes beyond that. I think all UN entities, without, regardless of whether they explicitly think of themselves as having a human rights mandate, particularly now we have the Secretary General's call to action for human rights, reminding us that all of the UN is responsible for making sure that human rights are, are implemented and are at the basis of our action. So I would even broaden it uh, to, to, to that. Um, and I think there is, of course, the victim's perspective, as you're pointing out, is extremely important. And we are indeed also discussing how we will, how, how we keep track of the impact and how we therefore can learn lessons from it so that we maximize impact because ultimately that's what matters. We're not setting in motion having institutions, mechanisms and reports. What we want to do is actually making sure 
that we are have a system in place that really helps victims and prevents these these uh, reprisals from occurring in the first place. So this is, and, and I think that was a very important finding that you had that to sustained uh, attention to cases over time, repetitive attention uh, really does seem to lead to, to better outcome. And I think that's a lesson we definitely need to take on board and, 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 and work on this. So going forward, we of course will continue to work on the coordination. We have done uh, and tried to do quite a lot, but we certainly are aware, aware and we take on board your uh, recommendation in that regard as well. The prov provision of specific tools and guidance to all, all UN entities, but gradually they need to be tailor-made for specific entities so that they're meaningful, but this is something we certainly engage on, we'll continue to do so. And fundamentally thinking, continuing to think around our working methods. It's still the beginning of establishing really this mandate. So not just, so we reinforce what has worked well, but we need to uh, have serious discussions and reflections and thanks for your input. And I hope we continue that dialogue over time and how really, what do we do to improve uh, the methodology? Um, I think particularly also being aware of all the cases where we, don't get you know the 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 uh, where we don't get the information where there is where we know that there are a lot of cases how do we for instance take take this on in the self-censorship issue for instance that we have previously discussed but that remains there but also the working methods are over overall so i i think certainly we have been training we've been focusing increasingly on the field um, ambassador roscoe also mentioned the link really and this is what we always remember that what matters is what ultimately happens in the field even when we talk about the interaction of bringing the information to headquarters to the security council or to other bodies but ultimately what happens in the field so we are very aware that we need to do that training and provide proactively the training for all UN entities in the field so that they also know and so that there's coherence in the approach and the response and that we know uh, how to deal with these cases so it's also another we have started already training and we will continue to do so. We for now have had workshops uh, in 11 different countries um, with a number of staff, but we certainly will also go on with this. But I will stop here so I don't take up too much time because I actually really also want to listen and learn just like, like we had in the beginning. Thank you. Thank you so much um, and, and thank you for your, your openness and your reflections um, and really your genuine energy and dedication and attention to this issue. Um, let's dive into the discussion with our panelists. So my first question is for Mariam, but let me introduce her briefly before uh, I pose it. Mariam al is a Bahraini woman human rights defender and international advocate on human rights issues. Currently working as a consultant and trainer on human rights, Mariam also serves on the board of directors of Civicus, the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy, and the Urgent Action Fund. She previously served as the Europe Director and Interim Advocacy Director at Physicians for Human Rights, Co-Director for the Gulf Center for Human Rights, and as Acting President of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. Mariam played an instrumental role in the democratic protests in Bahrain's Pearl Roundabout in February of 2011, which triggered a government response of widespread extrajudicial killings, arrests, and torture. Due to her work, Mariam has been subjected to assault, threats, defamation campaigns, imprisonment, and an unfair trial. Following the events of 2011, she emerged as a leading voice for human rights and political reform in Bahrain and the Gulf region. She's been influential in shaping official responses to the atrocities in Bahrain and the Gulf around the world by engaging with prominent European and American policymakers. Mariam has received numerous awards for her human rights work, including the RAFTO Prize, and was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize along with her father and her sister. We're very pleased to have her here with us today. So my first question for Mariam, um, as outlined in Yannicka's presentation, the MENA region emerges as being disproportionately represented. 31% of all cases and situations of reprisals and intimidation, and when we narrow in on named cases, 35%. Within the region, Bahrain leads all countries worldwide with Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Iran also in the top 10 perpetrators. In our report, we noted that the high number of reported incidents in the region over the past decade can likely be attributed to increased engagement with the UN by human rights defenders from the region in the wake of the Arab Spring. 
and the subsequent crackdown that ensued in many countries. I'd like to ask you for your reflections on that pattern and that connection made to the Arab Spring, but also what this means for the response. How should the response by UN mechanisms and states be tailored to address this reality? Maren, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madeline. And I wanted to start by thanking ISHR and GPPI for this report and for the recommendations you've made, like really, really great work and very timely, very needed, um, I think, especially in the current political context. It's been needed for years, but um, I think this is the perfect time for us to be having these conversations. Um, to answer the question, I think that, you know, the, when we look at the heightened numbers within the Middle East uh, and North Africa, or as many of us young feminists like to call it the Tswana region, um, Southwest Asia and North Africa. Um, when we look at why there's heightened numbers, I think part of it has to do with the way that funding works um, and the prioritization that is given to certain countries according to what's happening, according to the political context. And in some ways it can be quite problematic because we look at how when the when the 2011 uprisings happened, there was this influx of funding and, and attention to these different countries that were um, experiencing these uprisings. And unfortunately, what that also means is that once that moves on to situations in different countries or protests happening in other countries, then funding will die down in these countries and move on to elsewhere. Because there isn't, in my opinion, a um, well thought out holistic strategy for how funding is done for civil society and NGOs. So I think that's part of why um, activists and human rights defenders like myself had more access to the United Nations, had more access to go and actually do um, advocacy in Geneva, in New York, because there was that support to a certain degree. There was that support for activists to do that. Um, and of course, it also has to do with the crackdown, the amount of people who are being targeted and how, how much governments wanted to make sure to shut down those voices and to silence them. I do want to point out, you know, I agree with both the ambassador and the ASG that the United Nations can't do their jobs if HRDs are afraid to engage. I would say, unfortunately, it's not a question of if. HRDs are afraid to engage, right? This isn't a hypothetical future that we're talking about. The HRDs, especially, you know, from countries that are, are extremely repressive, are choosing to engage despite the risks, despite the fear, because the consequences are extremely real. Um, and we see, you know, especially when we see the drop in numbers, like for example, take Bahrain, right? Bahrain was one of the countries that was that had the, the highest numbers. And as per the reports, um, it also had a drop, a very significant drop in the numbers of cases being reported. The reason for that is because the majority of human rights defenders in Bahrain are currently either in exile or imprisoned or silenced and under travel. And so part of the issue is also what kind of cases are being reported. Um, are cases like my own, for example, I was released from prison and then you know I had to go into exile. Is that still a case that would get reported as a reprisal? I still don't have access to my country. I still can't travel to Bahrain. I still have ongoing cases in Bahrain where if I went back, I would go directly to prison and the pending sentencing. Um, does that get you know, still looked at as a, a case of reprisal? As far as I know, it hasn't, right? Um, but then there are also cases that are prolonged and I know that we'll talk about this a little bit more later. But I guess what I get to and, and, uh, and I'll uh, you know, round up with this is that We've been talking for years, you know, I've been I've been interacting with the UN for about 10 years now, if not longer. And uh, for about those 10 years, I've been saying that one of the things that we really need to pay attention and do something about when it comes to the United Nations, when it comes to reprisals and so on, is the double standards that exist um, of what is implemented in what country. Um, and when it comes to reprisals, it's interesting to me because we're asking the very same countries, the very same governments that commit acts of reprisals to then enforce actions, enforce, you know, vote for resolutions and so on that would protect human rights defenders from those very reprisals. Um, and a lot of times, you know, in the civil society circles, we, we rely on countries, especially in the West, to push through those type of uh, resolutions, to push through those types of actions around accountability. And what's troubling to me is that when we look at, for example, Bahrain, 
part of the reason the Bahraini regime is able to crack down on human rights defenders and civil society is because of the support that they get from countries like the United States, like the United Kingdom, like the European Union, where business is done as usual, despite the crackdown that happens, where you know there is military exchange, security exchange, economic exchange. And no matter how much you know crackdown there is, we've seen this in Saudi Arabia as well, you know, with Lujan Hatlul and others who have been arrested, Samar Badawi and others, some who are mentioned in the reports that despite these crackdowns, despite the reprisals, um, these governments, these monarchies in a lot of cases are being propped up and enabled by the West, by the very same countries who are pushing for an end to reprisals. And so I guess the question to me is, you know, the, the ASG is doing great work uh, with the small team, as it has been mentioned, has been doing great work in trying to respond to these cases. But how much is it, how realistic is it and how much can they actually do when we look realistically at what the setup is for the UN and what the capacity and the space created for them is? When we're looking at it from that perspective, the perspective of access, the perspective of funding, the perspective of will, political will, pure political will from governments to actually do something about reprisals. How much can they actually do in effect? How much can they actually instill accountability when it comes to reprisals um, and governments targeting those who interact with the United Nations? And just you know, pointing out as ISHR did in the report that we're, we're talking also about a very small, to a large extent privileged group within civil society, right? Because there's so many more who don't even have access to the United Nations and are not talked about, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam, um, for bringing in all of the different pieces of the puzzles, really. And um, you know, I hope that the, if we have any uh, anyone from the donor space uh, in the discussion, uh, you might want to uh, think about some of the thoughts that Miriam shared and be interested in any reactions as well. Um, but also the very important points you make about follow up when cases aren't resolved, but a new terrible thing hasn't happened. Does that mean the case, you know, doesn't deserve continued attention if if the status is the same? Um, which is something that we've also been advocating for for kind of a, a different sort of lens through follow up um, and, and obviously very important points about the geopolitical uh, linkages. Um, so my next question is for Tine um, and let me also introduce her properly uh, beforehand. So Christina or Tine Palobe has been the Secretary General of the Philippine Human Rights Group Karapatan since 2012. She's a convener of an Association of Women Human Rights Defenders in the Philippines and a regional council member of the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development. Tine was among the finalists in the Martine Anstet French Human Rights Prize in 2018. And in 2019, she was recognized as among the recipients of the Women Have Wings Courage Awards together with other women human rights defenders across the world. And we're very grateful to have her with us today, especially given how late it is in the Philippines right now. Thank you so much for staying up for us. Um, my first question for Tine, uh, one of the things that came through in the data, um, and Yannicka touched on this, is that victims of intimidation and reprisals often consider UN action on their cases helpful, even when this doesn't necessarily result in a substantial change in their material situation. Oh. Um, we concluded that the solidarity and legitimization defenders experience when they're able to tell their story and it's amplified in a UN report can be very significant. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the importance of that act of solidarity and perhaps how we can better understand the discrepancies we see in some cases between individuals' perceptions of UN impact versus the de facto lack of improvement in a situation. Mm -hmm. well First of all, thank you um, for ISHR, to ISHR and the ASG and Ambassador Roscoe and everyone joining this um, very insightful discussion. Uh, in the cases pertaining to the Philippines, I believe that UN action on the cases of reprisals has been helpful in the sense that in having a strong additional voice that additionally lends to uh, the legitimization of our work. Uh, of course, that's 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 the main um, feedback of defenders who face reprisals. To a certain extent, it also has a preemptive political effect for worse violations for some Filipino defenders, or it serves as a legitimate documentation of violations for those who experienced uh, further violations. But I think the moral support that UN actions 
lend to cases of uh, to those victims of reprisals may be understated. Uh, understated in the sense that um, um, based on what we have um, um, uh, talked with the other defenders, uh, these UN actions are appreciated because uh, it boosts their morale. It lets them know that there are institutions supporting them and they are not essentially invisibilized. Uh, and it gives them more confidence in confronting the challenges that they face. Um, on the other hand, it is understandable for defenders to sometimes see that these have no impact because you see inconsistencies. The, the, the study um, was, uh, I, I think, articulated at uh, this point that um, inconsistencies or cynicism because many states obtaining membership or being extended membership at the HRC have cases of reply, reprisals. The violations against the defenders continue to occur with impunity, and there is some lack of follow-up actions. But of course, all of this underscores the need for a more coherent policy and approaches in dealing with reprisals and intimidation, which includes, among others, taking a second look, a second hard look at the HRC membership processes additional support for the ASG mandate for a more robust follow-up mechanisms and actions, and an education campaign among defenders ourselves on the role that UN plays in ensuring um, uh, HRD protection, along with uh, the limitations you know, of the UN system itself. Because I think that's, that's important. Eh? That's the real politic <laughs> that we live in. Um, we, we, of course, it's, it's, it's um, imperative that we um, point out the obligations uh, of states. You know? But at the same time, we have to locate the strategies that we were looking at um, in, in stemming these forms of reprisals and intimidations in, in, the, um, in the overall advocacy and um, uh, in the overall strategy that we employ in protecting ourselves while engaging at the UN. Thank you so much, Tine, um, for those, um, again, you know, connecting all of the different pieces, um, the, your very helpful remarks on legitimization and visibility, and also uh, the preemptive effect, which I think, you know, we could dig a little bit deeper into that as well. Um, coming back now to um, uh, the ASG, um, a question for you on uh, resources. Uh, which is obviously a very important one for us at this stage now that we've kind of done the analysis and we have some results. The study has come to uh, a number of conclusions and recommendations, some of which could be implemented without additional resources and some of which realistically would require additional resources. Um, you've now been in the year in, in the role for about a year and a few months. Um, what is your sense of where additional resources could have a significant additional impact and in your view, which aspects of the mandate would benefit uh, the most from a tangible increase in resources? I'd be particularly interested in your thoughts on the suggestion in the report of more frequent reports at shorter intervals um, and the idea of a regularly updated database, both of which would be an evolution from the once per year sort of static uh, nature of the SG report, which is also how the special procedures work has evolved over the years from a once a year to a thrice a year to a more sort of live database. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that, that is, a, 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 sadly, a key question that we struggle with uh, there in, in all, all areas. But I would certainly say that we have the financial situation across the UN system as such, of course, that is, that is a big challenge. And, and we are clearly under-resourced uh, for this work in particular. And, and I will not repeat, although I now will repeat that we of course have two, two staff members uh, dedicated to this work and clearly that in itself shows um, how limited it is. Now, the good news is that we do have some strongly committed member states, of course, who have been uh, providing some support, but, but really it should be a more systematic one uh, that we need to, to, to get at. 
So if we had more resources, we certainly could work on exactly the strengthening of the internal coordination that we've been talking about already. We are doing what we can, but clearly to do it systematically, coherently, really in a way that goes across the system uh, would take more resources. So particularly for the guidance that we can provide for colleagues in all entities, but also the stress on the field, which was so important and the point was made, is something with all the guidance tools adapted specifically to the, the mandates and the constituency. So it's not just a matter of reproducing what is there and just disseminating it, but it really takes that targeted kind of work, which of course is resource intensive. So that we could do if we had more, more resources and ensuring more um, consistency. I would like to stress also the work that even this study shows as well, that we don't have enough time and resources to really properly do uh, the analysis that is needed over time and, and including also that work on the reflections we have on working methods, which we are trying to do with the team and we're very committed to doing it. But of course, we do that sort of as an extra add-on because clearly uh, the, the resources we have are fully taken up by, by doing uh, the reports as it is. So all of that, I think that in, in terms of the recommendations, certainly if we had more resources, we'd be able to do it. We do have a project on the Security Council, cooperation with the Security Council and, and grateful for UK support in this regard. And that has been very well received, um, not just by human rights officers, but really political civil affairs colleagues um, in peace missions. And that's a very important part of the work that shows that we can do a lot more to strengthen both the documentation and reporting, uh, but also the internal coordination part there as well, so that we actually get the information as much as possible also from the field and are we able to work uh, consistently on it. Again, the practical tools that we can have. So for the database, um, there, there is, we do have an internal database. Um, it's confidential for obvious reasons. And at this stage, we don't see that that is something that we would be making <clears throat> public. We, know, we are aware, of course, the special procedures, <clears throat> excuse me, the development you referred to. But, but this is, for us, it's still very important. And I wanted to make the point as well that, of course, there is, as we said initially, a, a, a limitation a little bit to go only on the database that is in the SG's reports, because, of course, we have a lot of information that we are not able to make public for confidentiality reasons. Um, and so that, I think, for the time being, we are not looking at making it public, but I think that there could be other actors where, you know, that there, there, uh, there's a complementarity again in the division of roles that we have and where civil society itself and, and your organization, uh, Madeleine and others, of course, have a very strong role to, to play in that too, that could maybe uh, find a way of, of going ahead with, with some of that kind of reporting. For the reporting, you know, it's, it seems it, it, there's a lot of work that goes into preparing the SG's report. It's very time consuming. We spend months and months on it because of course we get first to gather the information uh, uh, proactively where we send out the request and we have it, but we also have um, reports coming directly to us, the verification, all of the methodology that we do have in place to make sure that it's rigorous. Um, and, and also, um, looking at the trends and the cases themselves and then also the interaction that we have with the respective member states on the, the cases with all of the caveats around that. But this is something where with the resources that we have, it is not, it, it's not possible to do uh, more than this. Um, I don't know also that maybe before we jump into even the recommendation of having more frequent reports, I think we need to think a little bit about what we want to achieve by it, because it seems to me that one of the key issues is really making sure that the issue is gets adequate attention by member states at the Human Rights Council and also in New York in the various bodies. And it's not necessarily only by having a report to present that that can be brought there. So maybe there also we broaden maybe the, the thought around that recommendation and seeing how can we achieve that goal of making sure that there's consistent attention 
and really to muster the kind of the the issue of the political will of course that 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 was brought up by Miriam I think is very important but but also all, all of the other parts of that and I think that we need to keep it on the agenda as much as possible to do that the reporting is one way of doing it but not necessarily the only way there may be also other ways of reporting you know having oral reports in between is an easier lighter version of having written reports and so on so uh, many, many more things to think about. But, but if I could just very briefly comment also that I wanted to really pick up on the point that Miriam was making on the, <clears throat> on the fact that we also, the awareness, it's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we remember that the mandate that I have is the mandate for cooperation with the UN. So of course, there's a much broader issue in the context of civic space and human rights defenders overall, and of course we have the special mandate holder, but it's clearly the environment that we're dealing with. But I think that even there, of course, in the reporting is the attention to those, even the access as such to cooperation with the UN where small and local NGOs may not even have that. I think that's another, and part of the preventive work that we're doing, we need to think around those, those issues as well. And, and again, um, the awareness that is there, but then taking on Christina's point that we need to also make sure that when we have that increased awareness, we provide the information that we also are realistic about the expectations of what actually is possible and what isn't possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, your point about uh, consistent follow up and attention and also the role of states is an excellent segue to my next question for Ambassador Roscoe, which relates specifically to the role of states. Um, one of the emerging practices in the last few years that the study wasn't able to actually analyze, quantify and analyze because it's too new and there are too few examples at this stage is the emerging practice of states raising uh, specific cases of reprisals in UN fora. Uh, ISHR has long advocated for states to raise specific cases. We believe that it is you know, one lever we can pull um, to increase the political cost for perpetrating states of carrying out reprisals. Um, and we are very pleased that a small number of states have taken up that mantle. Uh, the Benelux countries notably mm -hmm have done it a number of times, Germany and also the UK recently. Um, so it is a small group, but we hope it is a growing one. Um, Ambassador, what can you share from that experience? And in particular, what do you think could be done to encourage other states to follow suit? Thanks, um, Madeline. I think, I mean, you, you hit the nail on that in the question by saying the key thing here is creating a political cost. Um, because states don't like to be called out um, for this kind of behavior. Um, and I think there are, there are two ways to do that. There's a sort of public way and there's the private way. And I think we use both. And, and one of the things that's going to make um, getting any kind of statistical um, understanding of this quite challenging is the amount of um, state to state lobbying that, that goes on privately um, around issues um, like this. And I think the two you need to decide when you want to use either one or the other tool. I mean, obviously, we have a we have a very effective network of diplomatic missions um, all over the world, and they have good access um, in these countries. And sometimes you can have more impact um, by identifying, you know, a country that has, you know, um, engaged in the rendition of a um, of an individual back to their home country where they might be at risk or has arrested someone or intimidated them by going in and, and discussing this with the state and saying, look, your security apparatus are engaged in this kind of activity. It's unacceptable. It's not constructive. Um, you need to stop doing it. Um, and if they're the kind of state you have the relationship with where you think they might respond, that can be a very um, effective mechanism. And so we, we do that a lot. Obviously, if you think it's a state where you're not going to have an impact through a constructive discussion, then the other way to do it is to call it out um, in international fora. Um, and that's the other, the other step that we take. Um, I think the really critical thing for us is that we have to have um, really compelling evidence of the, of the reprisal activity. Um, and, uh, and often one of the challenges is, is getting absolute ground truth um, about these things. Um, but I think, you know, I think it was um, Mariam who talked about, you know, this isn't just about Security Council briefers. 
Um, I, I worked in um, Sierra Leone for a couple of years and some of the most effective um, civil society were effective because they could get under the skin of the government and expose, you know, police activity that was um, brutal or, um, or corruption that was going on. And, and that makes them, uh, you know, very uncomfortable when it comes to the, to the government. And again, our relationship there with the government can be one that says, you know, you may not like being called out by this civil society actor, and it might be difficult for you, but actually they're doing you a favor in the long term because they're helping you address challenges that are undermining your effectiveness as a state. So instead of undertaking reprisals against them, why don't you bring them in and listen to them? Um, so there, there are different ways of doing this, but I think Miriam's point uh, that, you know, that we, we mustn't forget about the vast majority of civil society activists working at the grassroots um, who are affected by this. Um, and then I thought there was another um, good point about the Security Council itself taking more robust action, um, but also us applying scrutiny to incoming council members, you know, and saying, you want to be a member of the council, one of the things this council needs to do is hear from civil society. If you are the kind of state who is yourself repressing civil society, that's a problem. Um, and I think that the more we can talk about that and make, um, you know, respect for civil society and um, a policy of countering reprisal activity uh, critical to security council membership, the better. I mean, you know, we're a long way off from that. But I, I think making that part of the dialogue um, is really is really critical. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, um, the work done by ASG Karras and the team is also critical. Ultimately, states don't want to be named and called out. So the more detail and information we have through these reports, um, the easier it is for us to do that. Because again, it, we have to, when we engage in calling states out, we've got to do it on the basis of strong um, and, um, and in, you know, uncontestable evidence. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for sharing those thoughts on the the very kind of particular role of states and um, you know welcome your comments in particular about membership we've worked uh, a lot at the sort of nexus of the issue of membership and reprisals but with respect to the human rights council obviously also very relevant to the security council and to all bodies for that matter um, coming back to Mariam, um, I want to ask uh, you about prolonged cases, which is not an abstract question for you, given that your father, who was cited in the 2011 SG report on reprisals, has been in prison for 10 years now. Um, one of the conclusions we drew from our analysis was that, unfortunately, many cases show no significant improvement over a long period of time. Um, in fact, um, Yannicka pointed out in her presentation that cases where uh, there had been eight or more um, instances of raising a case are actually don't show the same positive impact anymore um, that we see with just the numbers slightly under that. Um, we recommended that such cases warrant more research and analysis on why the UN's approach has not been effective and what could be changed. One suggestion is that public statements on individual cases by the Secretary General and by the Assistant Secretary General could be a useful addition to the UN's action on reprisals, and it remains a largely untested tool. Um, there have been very few public statements of that nature. Of course, once implemented, we could then evaluate uh, the effectiveness of such public statements. We'd be very happy to do so um, as compared to other approaches. Um, so what are your thoughts on how all stakeholders can better address these long-term cases? Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think that suggestion is a good one. I think that there does need to be, especially when over many, many years, we see that the private silent approach or silent diplomacy approach isn't working for us to try other approaches. I think this idea that we can keep trying the same approach and hope it's going to work at some point isn't the, necessarily the best way to go. Um, but I also think that it's, it's exactly what you were saying about how when you have, you know, when you have seven, eight different statements or, you know, letters written by, by different, um, uh, you know, uh, special rapporteurs or, or um, you know, different UN bodies, then the effect is not necessarily the same. And I think that this is something that I've experienced myself, right? As you mentioned, my father has been in prison for 10 years as a human rights defender. Um, incidentally, my father was also one of the first civil society actors to ever speak at a UPR. 
um, which also very much angered the Bahraini government because of what he did. Um, and so they've been, you know, they've been waiting for the moment when they can get back at him for a long time because of his activism, because of the work that he's done, because of his engagement at the UN. Um, and so all of that, you know, being said, I saw very clearly how in my case, when I was imprisoned, because of the pressure that was created from, you know, governments from the UN, and especially from the High Commissioner on Human Rights, um, that I was able to be released. Um, in comparison, my father has not after 10 years, right? And I think part of that is the problematic setup of this is that it renders the, the tool ineffective when you use it too much. The reason why it was effective in my case was because it isn't used a lot, right? The, there isn't this, um, the, the tool of you know, speaking publicly and raising that much pressure isn't something that's used a lot. And if it were to be used a lot, it would be rendered useless because of the way that the system is set up. So what I'm trying to say here is that what we need to fix is the system itself, right? Um, the, a system that's broken cannot fix us. We have to fix it. Um, and that's that's only the, the only way forward that I can see really working. The other thing that I would say is that we need like within the UN system, I think we really need to do a better job at not looking at things in silo, right? Um, not looking at reprisals as if they exist on their own and looking at specific thematic issues as existing on their own. These things are all interconnected. When we talk about, you know, um, about, for example, access, right, access to the UN. One of the things that I noticed when COVID started, when the pandemic started, was that the first people to get cut off from the Human Rights Council were the NGOs. Um, the first things to be cut from the budget were the elevators and the, and the um, electric staircases, which meant that people with disabilities no longer had access to the Human Rights Council. So when the UN itself sends that type of message, which you know kind of sounds like the civil society is not at the very priority uh, at the heart of the UN, this sends a wrong message of where, this, where civil society and NGOs stand in regards to importance and priority for engagement for the Human Rights Council, for the UN generally. And it's the same thing, you know, when um, I don't think that there was enough of an adequate, there wasn't, an, an, you know, eventually a good response, but initially there wasn't an adequate response when NGO and civil society actors were being prevented from coming to the, Uni the United States to engage in the UN um, as well. And so all of these different things, they send messages. They're not direct. They're not something that we'll see on a report in a headline, but they do send messages that um, that, they, that civil society is not as important, that it is okay that civil society is not able to engage. And so looking at it from that perspective, that this is all tied into each other. And it's the same thing with membership, right? I completely agree with the ambassador that, you know, we need to ask those questions of, well, if you're becoming a member, what is your record on reprisals? What is your record on how you deal with um, civil society and human rights organizations? I think we need to go even beyond that and say, who are the people supporting those governments that allow them to continue to commit reprisals and, and uh, violence against civil society, right? So in the case of like Bahrain, Bahrain is currently a member of the Human Rights Council um, to the dismay of civil society in Bahrain that has been anything but obliterated. Um, and so when we look at Bahrain specifically, and then we have former ambassadors of the UK or the US uh, doing PR for the Bahraini government, you know, like ambassador, former ambassador Arelli or others, or even for, former MI6, um, you know, representative whose his name is Tantum, um, you know, now playing this role where they actually support these governments actively. Again, we can't look at this in silo. This all ties into each other. So when we talk accountability, when we talk about these issues, we really need to have a holistic approach of how they influence each other and then how do we actually respond to it in a holistic way so that we can you know, continue to, um, to do better, I think. Um, and especially for cases like my father, it's been 10 years, he's a torture survivor. He's someone who's supposed to be getting torture rehabilitation and support and, and you know, supposed to be healing from everything that he's been through. Instead, as a 60 year old man, he's sitting in a prison cell where we're worried that he might contract the virus at any time and potentially die from it. Um, and so there is also a sense of urgency around these cases. We shouldn't wait until there's a sense of urgency to be talking about, well, how do we get these people out of prisons? Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, yeah, and thank you again for for kind of bringing in the the sort of notion of the interconnectedness and the need to really take a look at this from a system wide perspective. 
Um, another uh, kind of sort of point of gatekeeping and entry you didn't mention is the NGO committee, um, which we won't you know have a chance to talk about uh, in this discussion now, but also is is an area where um, states are you know blocking access, like you said, looking at access um, and and needs to be studied further. Um, I'm receiving a lot of questions through the Q&A, so I'm wondering if we might take a few of those just as we're about 15 minutes out from the uh, event ending. Um, Ambassador Roscoe, questions come through on Venezuela that I'm wondering if you might be amenable to answering. Um, from Beatriz Borges, uh, recently civil society organizations declare their resounding rejection and demand the repeal of the new registration measure for terrorism and other crimes in Venezuela. Um, the ruling violates the human right to freedom of association, changing its current regulatory framework, which does not admit any prior control by imposing that civil society organizations can be subject to the state's permission control. Sorry, it's shifting on me um, and possible revocation. The administrative ruling is unacceptable and would bring greater unfortunate consequences of human suffering for the Venezuelan population uh, severely affected by serious human rights violations, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the multidimensional emergency that the country has been experiencing for many years. Um, of course, Venezuelan human rights defenders um, are frequently attacked um, and suffer reprisals for their engagement with, with the UN. Um, what is the UK doing? And also what else can the United Nations do to protect defenders and civil society organizations in, in Venezuela? So, I mean, it's incredibly, difficult right when when this when this happens um in a country like venezuela where you have a government that um sets out to um to oppress its own people um to um remove any kind of um real democratic engagement um and in particular to to crush um civil society and um and you know we've seen millions of people um, fleeing Venezuela um, and being displaced. Um, and, um, and obviously that you now have a very effective and active civil society, but, but working from um, outside Venezuela's borders, mainly from some of the neighboring states. I mean, what the UK tries to do in Venezuela is provide um, as much humanitarian support as we can, both for, the, um, for, for those who've been displaced, um, but also into Venezuela itself, and we do that through um, the UN agencies um, mainly, but also directly. Um, and where we can, we we speak up for um, democracy in Venezuela, and you know, and try to do what we can to ensure um, that um, the Venezuelan government, the, the, sorry, the Venezuelan regime, um, feels pressure to have proper elections. But I suppose the fundamental point about Venezuela is we're hearing from Beatrice um, that there are people um, who are either still in Venezuela or Venezuelans outside who are still challenging the state, who are still trying to call out the state um, for these actions. I mean, I, you know, I hadn't heard about this particular um, step that was being taken by, by, the, um, by the regime there. Obviously, it is designed purely to try and, um, and hamstring further or an already crushed um, civil society in, in the country. And I think when a state takes an action like this, it gives you a sense of, of um, its broader behavior and, it, and its broader attitude towards, towards its citizens. So, so thank you for, for letting us know about this. Um, we will continue to call out um, the regime in Venezuela. We'll continue to call for proper um, free and fair elections, which are the only possible way forward. And, and in the interim, we'll do everything we can to, to help those suffering in the country. Thank you so much. Um, and we hope we can count on the support of uh, a number of governments in, in calling out Venezuela on the reprisals uh, consistently, uh, predictably carried out against defenders who are regularly still coming to the council to engage. Um, ASG, um, Brands Karras, I'm wondering if I can ask the question posed in the chat by Andrea Roca. Um, look, it, was, it relates to the HRC presidency. Um, looking at the findings, the HRC presidency performs very poorly at publicly addressing cases occurring in connection with the HRC. Uh, the study found it only addressed 6% of cases publicly, which is way below the rate at which all the other mechanisms are publicly addressing cases relevant to them. 
This is even more alarming, given that almost half of HRC members are mentioned in the SG report. Uh, what can be done by the senior official and other stakeholders to encourage the presidency to meet its responsibilities to address reprisals cases beyond just quiet diplomacy? Thank you. Um, it, it's an important question because, again, we all, we all have to uh, play our, our part in making sure, and in a coherent way, obviously, to, to have even a chance of being effective. So, and of course, the Human Rights Council presidency has a very important role. I think mean, the, the one thing that is very clear is, of course, to have a no tolerance at any event to speak out directly and stop any any signs of intimidation taking place already and I, I, I do think that that is uh, taking place but we need to remember that as well and then the question is how to prevent um, or, or to address reprisals when they become known I know that the presidents I have met with two of the presidents uh, at this stage uh, and I think that each of them uh, have have stated how strongly committed they are to actually addressing uh, reprisals. But I think there is also a discretion of how that work, of course, proceeds with them. So it's, it's, it's also true that there may be a shifting uh, sense of how much should be in the quiet diplomacy file uh, and, and how much really should be a more open and public way. For us, um, the, and, and again, I think this, by the way, it also the research that we're now talking about or having studies and the impact and the effectiveness of various kinds of interventions, I think is a key component of making sure that we all have the same understanding of what is effective in which cases. I think it was very important what you pointed out and the issue of repetitive and public engagement, but that that also, and as Miriam said, if it's overused, then it actually can work against itself at some time. So I think there's still a lot more we need to find out about how to address that. But I do think we cooperate, of course, with also with, with, the, with the, uh, the Secretariat, with the Human Rights uh, Council Presidency. Um, and here, uh, we, for us, it's important. Another aspect of that is that when it is made public or when it goes, at least cases go, for instance, into the Bureau minutes, then we are able to take up that information in the SG report. But if it is done only as quiet diplomacy, of course, it never will make it into the report or, or anywhere else. So in that sense, I think the, again, the, the symbiosis of the different ways that we work is very important too, that we work together in, in, in more uh, coherently. Now, I do think there is a role for quiet diplomacy, but of course it depends on how it is done and the fact that we don't really know um, the, the impact and the follow-up on that is, is an important question that we need to discuss, but unfortunately, Again, that will not be part of the public materials, but I do I do agree that the president and of course the present president um, uh, is is from a member state who when she was the PR from a member state is part of the core group supporting reprisals. So I know also from my interactions with her that she's particularly committed to really making sure that the work on reprisals is taken up seriously by the Human Rights Council. Um, so, so I hope to continue that work and the coordination there too. And of course, we are always available to also give guidance and to make sure that there is an understanding of how to handle the cases and wherever we can, uh, our team will always be there to support as well in that work. So, so with, there's work that needs to continue to go on. I think that the issue that we raised on the scrutiny that I think is increasing for the, the kinds of events that were organized, the dialogues before for the candidate for membership to the Human Rights Council is a very good tool to also bring these issues, of course, and that is for you know, to make sure that that statement goes on record. We, as we know, it doesn't always mean that there will be a change in behavior immediately, but at least with a statement on record, one has something to work on. So there are many different aspects that can be worked on there. And we, we can do only part of that, but we're certainly there to be to, to very happy to support whatever work and development of that work that, that is done and we'll continue to encourage it as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we're quickly running out of time. I want to get back to Tine for at least one more question. Um, and then if we have some time after, maybe I'll try and get another one from the chat. Um, Tine, my last question for you. Um, in analyzing the impact of UN action on different types of reprisals, 
One interesting finding was that UN action on defamation cases in particular is assessed more positively, especially in the short term. So one possible explanation is the attention that the UN brings through its actions is particularly effective in countering smear campaigns um, because it helps to validate the work of human rights defenders and it delegitimizes attempts to discredit their engagement with the UN. As a defender from the Philippines, you're no stranger to defamation and smear campaigns as a tool of reprisals, clearly. Um, how do you see the UN's role in countering such attacks and what more can be done by the UN or by other stakeholders, including civil society and other states in this regard? Mm -hmm. Well, um, one thing that we that came up in our conversations uh, with several communities here is that um, the role of the UN in um, in in raising the profile not only on the certain cases but also on the work itself of human rights defenders is extremely important, especially at the time when there's so much disinformation. Yeah. And um, there, there are also um, strong suggestions on uh, UN entities, uh, including perhaps the UNASG, to um, work uh, closely uh, with uh, some tech companies, uh, with, um, with media organizations in monitoring and documenting the smear campaigns and in taking actions against them. For example, in our particular case in the Philippines, immediately after a resolution on the Philippines for technical cooperation and capacity building on the situation was passed last October, um, myself and the Commission on Human Rights uh, were red tagged af immediately after you know, a resolution containing a specific provision against reprisals. Imagine this is a resolution that was co-sponsored by the Philippine government itself <laughs> and immediately after it committed a form, another form of reprisal against those of us who were actively um, uh, working for, uh, um, for, for, for the said, uh, not exactly the said resolution, no, but for measures to um, uh, look into the situation in, in the Philippines. So what I'm saying is that um, we can work within, you know, the, the 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 things that we have now, the processes that we have now. But there can also be out of the box thinking on how we can uh, mitigate these um, um, forms of defamation against defenders. And there's increasing work right now uh, on digital spaces. Uh, so that is one aspect by which the UN can perhaps. Um, work with defenders and other um, institutions. Of course, the work on providing support for embattled def defenders is, is another thing. But I'd also like to raise the, actually one of the issues raised in, in the chat box on uh, the issue of uh, mainstreaming, the issue of reprisals in global counterterrorism, counter in discussions on global counterterrorism strategy because uh, we fear that um, there's not much um, space hmm, in discussing human rights issues, human rights defenders, much more the issue of reprisals in these spaces. And this is a growing trend all over the world, you know, not only in the Philippines, that we're being outrightly called out at the UN Human Rights Council as terrorists hmm, in statements of states uh, and outside of it more. So. Um, I mean, there are many things that can be done you know, within and outside the box that we are in right now in terms of addressing the issue of reprisals. Thank you so much, Tine. Um, so we are actually out of time. Um, I'm without asking a question specifically, I just want to flag one more thing I just saw in the Q&A box around state to state dialogues, just to flag to Ambassador Roscoe and to the ASG. It's an interesting idea um, about state to state dialogues being reported to the ASG where they are taking place. Um, and, and, you know, integrating that into the follow up on cases. I don't know to what extent it's being done or if it's being done systematically, but that is a, an interesting idea that could be good to follow up on. Um, so unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. I really want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists today for their you know, rich contributions and for sharing your time and your expertise with us. 
um, as well as your attendee, our attendees. Thank you so much for your attention and for your contributions uh, through the q and I'll uh, take note of all of the questions, of course, um, and, and take them with us further as we continue this work. Um, the conversation obviously doesn't stop here. Um, so please, if you haven't downloaded and read the report, please do. We're always interested in any feedback that you have and certainly how we can all work together towards the implementation of its many recommendations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.